Hello and thanks for having me. I'm Justine Williams, an artist and educator working at Queensland College of Art, which is located at Griffith University in Brisbane, Australia. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of lands in which we are meeting and pay respects to the elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island people that may be with us today. This first slide from 2011 is a work called Crutch Dance. It's really quite indicative of some of my earlier video works, performances for camera. Basically I made a set, a costume and I had objects and, um, and then I'd turn the camera on and I would begin my performance. Uh, I believe that the costume really has the power to transform and uh, when you put on a mask or a costume you really forget about the ego and allows you to go somewhere else and become someone else and forget about yourself so much and that's where the performance magic can begin. Uh, a lot of my early performances involved radios because I like the idea of the static and tuning in. Um, this work was actually kind of in some way um, inspired by Umberto Boccioni's Continuous Forms in Space 1913. This, you know, heavy bronze sculpture, you know, that's so strong and epitomises everything that the futurists were interested in, which was the that domination and the violence and the strength and uh, that kind of me mechanic mechanical uh, body almost um, and the machine age really for me I started to think about what that what is that and for me really it was at that time you know someone running on a treadmill just going around and around and around running 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 going nowhere where you're just trying to get excess kilos off I was also interested for a long time with kind of this idea of camouflaging the body into the scenery. Uh, I think it had something to do with kind of, of course, being anonymous, but also maybe this, I liked this idea of flattening the body as if it's in a picture plane. A lot of my earlier works too involved, uh, actually carries through to today where I'm actually interested in using objects that have been decommissioned or technologies that have become redundant. I use those, particularly here you can see the CRT TVs, which are just, I love the design of some of these old CRTs, which at the time people were just throwing out in front of their um, houses. And so I picked them up and collected them and I used them in my work. Same with the palettes. So the black ones, you know, have a particular look and then the silver TVs have another look again. Another constant in my work is, uh, particularly my performance work, is the, you know, inclusion of friends and family and uh, people that, you know, are not necessarily professional performers. And so for this work, which was around the same time, about 2011, uh, this work was for an exhibition um, based in the idea of love. And so for me, it was familial love and I brought my family in, my mum and dad, performed with me on the day we just had bread and milk because they're just such you know everyday constants for us at our place um, and the coat hanger is something that for me speaks to retail because I worked in fashion retail for a long time but also it's like a an antenna you know you can tune into somewhere else and I'm always trying to do that I think somehow in work so this is the work that video then with other videos as well brought it back into the space in the installation and I also started to bring some of the set and reconfigure the set back out into the installation. I'm also inspired a lot in my work by the idea of making do so I suppose that's that idea of using these um, recycled materials but just that aesthetic of um, you know when people yeah just making do really and so these cars were I saw these um, one was at an airport one was just as I was driving along this is a work uh, it was made for a work called the curtain breathe deeply which was made a little bit later in 2014 and a ute that ute was my father's and it became mine and the ute really for me uh, which is another kind of 
thread that runs through my work is the idea of the suburbs. So everything, though I look, I kind of, um, looking back at art history and I look at this modernism and, um, and I use this performance, but it's all filtered through the lens of the suburban and really what the aesthetics of that is. And for me, it's very much the Australian, some of it's quite kitsch, the Australian, you know, suburban aesthetic. Others, it's about that kind of machismo, um, and what it meant for me growing up and these particular symbols that grew up. And so for me, the ute was always this, um, the men, you know, drew her, drove around in utes because they were strong and they were tough. But for me, I then place it in this space and create this uh, minimalist uh, type shrine um, an altar and then place the female form at the top, kind of challenging those ideals or ideas. Um, for that same show called The Curtain Breathe Deeply, I was also looking at, which I have looked at um, as well or examined in my work through in the performance and through in the videos, um, the idea of ritual and ritual as a way of coming together and social rituals. And for this work too, it really was uh, also based very much uh, because my father had passed away. So it was that idea of systems of belief, where do we go? Um, you know, and what these, you know, religious festivals and social ris um, rituals that we partake in around particular events in our lives. Um, it was also about, you know, do you believe in art? So, uh, yeah, this work really, this particular video, in a way, my father uh, was a member of a men's uh, group called The Lodge. So they're, and they were kind of like this secret uh, I don't know, club that men would go to and so I imagine what they would do there and so this is some kind of imagining of that and this is just an installation from that and you can see that curtain there is actually costumes and so I've repurposed the costumes to become a uh, curtain. This is another video from that same one where there's these owls and owls for me are like spirit animals and it's that. Um, so moving forward to 2015 um, I started to make much more, I started collaborating with more people and make larger scale works and so I would have to hire more people and these are some of the um, sewers uh, that helped me make particular costumes for a work for the Sydney Biennale where uh, I worked with, a, collaborated with an uh, opera company called Sydney Chamber Opera and we worked together to remake or uh, bring to life um, the futurist opera from 1913 called Victory Over the Sun. Now this is famous, um, I'm sure you might know, uh, for Kazimir Malevich's costumes and sets, but also it was where he, it's meant to uh, have you know, really start to get the idea from the back cloth, from making the back cloth of the uh, sets where the black square came from and the first, you know, the, his black monochrome. So it's really quite a seminal work in art history. So these uh, costumes you can see here, I've kind of riffed on some of the drawings that Malevich had made. This is the... Um, an image of the first, um, sh you know, performance of Victory Over the Sun at, at Luna, um, Luna Park in St. Petersburg. And this is once the, uh, so basically this performance, which involved opera singers, dancers, a rewriting of the libretto. I really did try to, when I was working with the opera guys, make sure that you know, because the futurists always were males uh, in their performance and in the way that they thought. I just brought more women into the script and, you know, into the libretto. And then, so we had six shows and then after the shows, so usually at the side of perform these performances, I uh, then make an installation which involves the ephemera, the, the props and videos and any documentation from the work. So this was at... Cockatoo Island, which is an island in the middle of Sydney Harbour, so it's quite hard to get to. And it was 
what was great about it other than being completely rustic like this is that I could create um, a, you know a, a, an installation for people that, that then a performance could occur and so it wasn't didn't happen in a theatre space, didn't happen in a regular museum. It was in this raw space which already had a particular patina and I could, you know, uh, create um, where the audience sat. So I learned a lot from that. It wasn't easy working with um, those, some of the people, but it, I, I did learn a lot from that. And then moving forward to 2016, uh, once again I was inspired by sketches from a futurist uh, this time, Fortunato de Pera, and I really, uh, you know, this uh, never eventuated, this performance. And I don't know if the costumes were ever made, but um, I was inspired by that idea, you know, for me, the costume covers the body, it's a way of moving. I mean, I've, had, I've got a, a history of dance before I came into art, so for me, there's that movement and you know, this idea of costumes that inform movement or restrict movement and how you can actually speak through the body and these um, musical instruments on these um, costumes were really in, um, intrigued me. So I made my own, you know, mine is completely different but a similar idea. So these were very much just made from ordinary materials like I used a lot of boiler suits or um, overalls that motor mechanics would use and then I paint them with um, paint and then I use Ikea window blinds and create head pieces and then children's um, mus musical t um, instruments. These ones are accordions and they're all attached to the crotches and the armpits of these fan dancers and um, I was interested in, you know, does the sound inform the movement or does the movement then create the sound so it was kind of interesting I was also interested at the time I just had um, a baby and I was interested also in the idea when th that pre-language that um, you have as a child where you all you can do is scream or cry and so I also had heavy metal singers or um, screamers or growlers and they were a part of that where they were growling this guttural um just way of expressing yourself in a very guttural way to, um bef without using traditional forms of language i mean there was still some singing singing in the um performance but i was interested in those other ways of making sound and communicating there was also uh these towers where people would climb up these towers and they were activated with sensors um, to make sound as they moved up and down those. I also ran out of money and couldn't afford as many performers as I uh, wanted but so I used uh, mannequins, shop mannequins in there and that's been a constant in my work. Here's a mannequin that I used which I've also used in previous performances, it's an earlier work, where I inserted like sprayed fogger spray into the holes of these mannequins as if trying to bring them to life or in, bring some kind of life um, to them. At the time I was trying to fall pregnant. So for me, other than the mannequin standing in as a surrogate and as this, um, you know, cheap <laughs> performer, it was also a way that for me to create magic because I do believe that performance can be magic both in terms of an art sense and in real life because, yeah, I suppose that's the reason why I planted plants in the mannequins if you're trying to grow. Then I also had all these more, more mannequins left over so then I started to make some sculptures from those mannequins. So there, and then I made some more sculptures from mannequins and other stuff. This is another work with that where I collaborated with some friends. Anyway, this last uh, work that I kind of want to just talk to you about is really a, it's moving further away from performance art in some ways and moving more into theatre and it's where I became interested in the idea of the grey space. So it's not really the black box of the theatre or the white cube of the gallery, it's this grey space that I'm kind of working in and really was inspired by my little girl who started to take her to live, 
you know, theater and some of it was great, but some of it was also very cookie cutter, you know, there's the stage and there's the seat and it was um, not so inspiring. And I, th I was interested in what could I bring to this conversation and um, particularly in terms of this creating a space that was more like an installation and um, also I wanted to try and for the first time really write my own narrative, you know, um, like a linear narrative. So I really just, you know, based it on fairy tales that we know. So it was called She Conjured the Clouds and really it's about my daughter when she was born in hospital and as she had her arms up to the ceiling, she kept twinkling and twinkling looking up to the sky and I really think that she was like something from the heavens. It's really extraordinary and I did try, it took me a long time to have her and so I do feel like she had some magic. And so the, the work was uh, based on a character called Nefella Bata. And Nefella Bata is an old word which means one who walks with the clouds or thinks up in the clouds. And I felt like that was uh, really my daughter in a way. And so, of course, it's a traditional uh, fairy tale in that, you know, the protagonist, the father goes, she, the, the father goes missing into the enchanted woods or the cursed woods. And then she goes on an adventure and she finds all these other characters and then in the end she gets become stronger and then she her father appears um, when the rain comes or the heavens open and when she does this kind of um, dance or, yeah. So that's just one of the characters there. Um, uh, that was the beekeeper. So it was really great to make some of these fun. These were really fun, these costumes and the in volumetric in a different way. So these were like the popcorn people. Um, and I worked with people uh, with all sorts of different, uh, you know, specialisations. And uh, so I worked with acrobats and aerialists. And um, so these were the bats. And there was one guy that was fantastic. This guy's Paul Nanari. He was uh, a Paralympian. And he also was an aerialist and he was extraordinary. He was so generous and he also had got his wheelchair here and he came down off this ramp that you're looking at and ran down into the audience. He was just fantastic. And this other girl here who played the main, main character, Nafella Pata, is actually a quite a famous Australian kids performer from the Wiggles, she's the Yellow Wiggles, and so it was really an honour to work with her, but I worked with her, or she worked with me, because really another big part of the work was that I really wanted to somehow introduce Auslan, and once again it was about language and communication and work and expressing through the body a non-traditional kind of form of language. And so Auslan, which is Australia's uh, deaf signing or deaf language, um, Emma here, um, Emma Watson Wiggle is actually, she has been learning it and she's quite proficient in it. And so she, and I, I liked that idea that the, uh, this, this deaf signing and this gesturing could become a form of dance. So it could actually, I was interested in ac accessing a, a wider audience. So people with, uh, that were deaf or hard of hearing and then also, I wanted to bring in more elements. So there, we had vibro-tactile um, sound so that the speakers and were quite bass and they were underneath, kind of underneath the seats, um, which was great. It was, it was quite challenging, this work, but very rewarding in that I, when I finally wrote this, um, the story for this, um, then, of course, when I had to bring the Auslan elements in, that's a whole different language and it's not the same way that we speak. And so a lot of it was chopped about, but it was really so interesting. And another part of the work was that in between the uh, performances, we'd have these tactile tours where we'd have people who were... Uh, you know, sight impaired could come and feel the costumes while they also, so as they went into the performance and they were, um, you know, kind of 
They also had a, a headphones or earpieces that describe what was going on. They already had a sense because they felt a lot of the costumes. Um, so that was really quite interesting. And so that just happened just before we went into lockdown. And so I haven't done that much more. That's meant to travel that work, but I'm not sure. Uh, it's actually going to be traveling in April next year. So it's a while away. But that's pretty much it for the moment. Uh, thank you very much.